Welcome to Avid Bookshop's event in support of local author Will Leach's brand new book, his debut novel, How Lucky. Ordinarily at events, um, especially for book launches, I will hold up the brand new beautiful hardcover um, because we have extras at the shop that I can grab. But something happened this time, which is that you all uh, bought our complete first order. You bought out our second order. You bought out our third order, and we're waiting on another shipment of the books. So instead, I'm holding up a special bookseller perk, which is an advanced reading copy of the book. Uh, but those of you who ordered will be getting that fancy hardcover. Thank you so much for your support. So my name is Janet Geddes. I am the founder and owner of Avid Bookshop. We call ourselves a fiercely independent bookshop here in Athens, Georgia. We have been closed to the public due to the pandemic for 14 months now. Um, and we are alive and well and holding on and making payroll every single period, thanks to your support. So we really thank you all for being here tonight. I and my coworkers at Avid are really big fans of both of these authors. Uh, many months ago, Will let us know that he had a book that was going to come out soon. And so we've been planning with him to do this event. It's hard to believe this night is really here. So uh, Will Leach and Kevin Wilson will now be in conversation to entertain us. I'm really looking forward to hearing what they talk about. We really would love for you all to participate. This is your event too. So we're celebrating Will, but we'd love to hear from you in the chat with questions and comments. Um, and after we do a little bit of the conversation between the two authors, uh, Kevin will be choosing some questions from the chat to ask Will. So don't hold back, ask whatever you're interested in. We're really curious to know what you're thinking about. Um, and then after the Q&A, once again, I'll jump on at the very end, thank everybody and invite everyone to turn on their screen so that we can say hello. So without further ado, I introduce you to author Kevin Wilson, who will be in conversation with author Will Leach. Take it away, y'all. Uh, first off, before we start, I want, to, I want you to know if the questions are too personal, please hold back, okay? But I want you to send a bunch of questions, but don't make them too hard. I'm trying to have a celebration here. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to finally get to meet you uh, over Zoom, but still at least get to meet you, Will, and um, talk about this really incredible book. Um, I wondered if if you might start us off by, by reading something from it. Is that all right? Yeah, it'll be short. It'll be, it'll be very short. It's very weird. This is also the, I've written books in the past 10 years ago before I had children, which, you know, makes it harder. And uh, so... Uh, I've never actually had an audio book before. This is my first ever audio book. I was listening to it in the car with my son on the way to Athens Little League yesterday. And the, the, uh, the man who did it, his name is Graham, is really good. And it made me instantly nervous about like reading my stuff because he's a lot better than I am. So fortunately, it's very short. It's literally the beginning of the book. And there's actually kind of a story about this that maybe we can discuss. So it'll be very quick, I promise. And then you can send all your questions that are way too of, of a personal nature uh, afterwards. <clears throat> okay, so here it is. It's very quick. How lucky. This is the first page of the book. My life is not a thriller. My life is the opposite of a thriller. What a relief. Who wants their life to be thrilling? Don't get me wrong. We want our lives to be exciting. We want them to inspire, to be in surprising, to provide us a reason to get up and experience something new every day. But thrilling? No way, man. Everything that happens in a thriller would be completely bleeping. My kids are watching this. Bleeping terrifying in real life. You've seen a million chase scenes in movies, so many that you barely even look up from folding laundry when one happens in whatever you happen to be watching on Netflix at that particular moment. They are dull, they are rote, and they are boring. But if you were in one of those chase sequences, you would be running for your life. It would be a nightmare. If you survived it, you would spend years trying to get over it. You would shake and cower about it in therapy. You would have nightmares reliving, for, reliving it from which if you woke up screaming, you'd have trouble developing any sort of human connection with another person. It would be the worst thing that ever happened to you. Real life, mercifully, is not a thriller. Those things don't happen to you and they don't happen to me. My life is nothing but small moments and so is yours. We do not live in a series of plot points. We should be thankful for that. We should realize how lucky we are. See, I even got the title in. There, there's, <laughs> there you go. There's a, there's a great uh, meme online of everyone um, uh, uh, doing a, su a super cut of people saying the names of the movies that they're in. And they're like, they're like, oh yes, I suppose that's true here on Titanic. <laughs> so, so I just that was my little moment uh, uh, there. So anyway, sorry, Kevin. Yes, go ahead. That, no, it was that was super organic. It it, <laughs> it it was it was it was well done. I think. 
Well, you, you said there's kind of a story about that last little bit of the of the of the of that of that section that you read. Do you, could you tell us about that? Yeah, that was not actually the original beginning of the book. Uh, the beginning of the book actually starts with Daniel, who is the main character of the book, who's 26 years old and has a spinal muscular atrophy, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, as we go along. Uh, the original starts of the book is him actually seeing uh, the woman that he sees uh, walking the college student that he sees walking down the street. That's actually how the book started, and it was actually I I think I. I Apparently, uh, we made it too riveting <laughs> because uh, what happened was we sent this out. The, a little backstory on the book. I just kind of decided to do this. My agent, uh, David Gernert, who I always joke has, uh, he, he, is, uh, he, he has nine clients, one of which is John Grisham. And, eight, and the other eight of which are people who are not John Grisham. And I am one of the people who is not John Grisham. So I had not written a book for him for like a very long time, but we like it same touch every once in a while. And but I basically wrote this, I didn't even tell him I was doing it. He didn't even know I, I, I he had no idea. I was even writing a novel, a, a book, let alone a novel at all. We talked about some projects, that, but I just kind of did this quietly because I kind of wanted to just, I kind of figured out Daniel's voice and wanted to figure out what to do with it. But I also didn't want there, I just wanted expectations to be as low as possible. I think I actually told him when I finally did meet him, I'm like, if this just gets published in like the University of Wisconsin Platt Press to like seven people and has like an ISBN number, uh, that's fine. Like I, that, that, that's enough. But the point is, is that like, I did not map the whole thing out. I did, I just kind of put it together and there were plot points and so on. And so people loved this beginning and they loved the voice, but they were like, wait, the beginning of this makes it feel too much like a thriller when it's actually kind of a thriller, but a, a lot of other things as well. And so they ended up not buying the book because of that, because a lot of publishers were not buying the book for that. And so I, I and some of the, uh, the, the complaints I think were pretty fair and relevant. I think we had kind of fixed them a little bit, but it was funny because after a while I was getting so frustrated. I'm like, guys, this book is not a thriller. Like it's not like there are thriller aspects to it, but it's not like this like conventional like, oh no, look, it turned out that she was in it all along. Like that sort of, it's just not that kind of book. And I think people were, I think because of the beginning of the book that you see this moment, people felt that. So David, my, my agent said, you're just having a hard time because you're just setting expectations so high with the beginning of the book. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what. Dave, I call him Dave when I'm mad. Uh, I said, okay, Dave, um, uh, I'm just starting the book with this is not a thriller. <laughs> and we're just gonna get it out there and just put it out there so people just know from the beginning. And uh, it turns out it's become like actually one of people's favorite parts of the book because it like, it, it establishes uh, Daniel's voice, I think pretty clearly uh, in it. And I, I think hopefully uh, we actually said outside of space and time, that was another issue because the book takes place over one week. And so, but that takes place before that week happens. And originally the, it's, the book started with that week that allowed us to be a little bit more flexible with the fact that once this woman disappears, there are news stories about her and that, that can happen before the book actually starts. So it actually fixed that idea, but uh, certainly, you know, Kevin, you've been, you know, and for the record, like, it feels very weird to talk about, here's my process. When like Kevin Wilson is there, he's like one of the best fiction writers in the world. Uh, but I, but for me, you know, one of the things I work in journalism, you know, and I've always, you know, I'm, I'm, I research things and, I, and I, I'm used to sticking to, you know, things that happened. <laughs> and, uh, and so at first I thought it would be like completely freeing. It would be so exciting to be like, great. I could just make the little people do whatever I want them to rather than the things that they actually did. But the problem is, and I mentioned this this morning on a television thing, that uh, in, in real life, particularly over the last like maybe half decade or the last year or so, um, we've all just collectively decided that people are just gonna do irrational and say things all the time and we do not need exp any explanation. We've just decided there things are nuts. People are crazy. We do not need any sort of motivation. Just weird things happen all the time. But you can't do that in fiction. Everything has to have a reason. Everything has to have a motivation. It has Everything has to tie together. And so uh, that was a challenge uh, in, in that for me. But to me, the key thing was I knew that I had Daniel's voice. I knew I knew who he was. I had researched, I'd done a lot of research in SMA. So I felt comfortable with that part of it. And really the other stuff was like, right, there's like expectation. There's a character in this book named Marjani who like literally we got like a couple notes being like, can maybe Marjani like be in on the kid? I'm like, no, no, of course not. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I think that's partly my fault because to be honest, I don't, 
inherently read a lot of those kind of thrillers myself. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just not the books that I read. And so uh, I don't know a lot of those conventions that usually go into them. And so uh, I wasn't actively trying to subvert them. I just did not know what they were. <laughs> and so therefore wrote a book that people did not understand uh, was a thriller as first. The best way to subvert things is to not know that they exist in the first place. <laughs> yeah, and then you can is, take all the credit. Later. It, it, it's remarkable how many things I am unwittingly subverting on a daily basis then because the, the list of things that I do not know uh, uh, veers toward the infinite. Well, I think, I mean, you've kind of led me into, I mean, the opening, I, I do find that opening really um, kind of important for the book because it introduces that voice so clearly. And and I kind of talked about, it reminds me a lot of like, um, of like Maddie Ross in, in True Grit by Charles Portis, this, this um, kind of character who is kind of a little flummoxed to believe that their life is actually worth telling another person about. And so there's this kind of inviting tone to that kind of openness. Uh, and I just immediately fell in love with Daniel's voice. And it's interesting to say that that's what you started with. Cause I did want to know like, what was the, what was the impetus for writing this book? Yeah, well, the, the impetus to come up with, with Daniel was, you know, the, the, the backstory to the book a little bit is that my, uh, one of my son's closest friends, uh, uh, Miller David, the, those people that may know the, uh, the Eason David and, uh, and Lindsay David, they live in Charleston now, but they are, uh, she's a dog, she's here. If you, ever, if you ever go to a tailgate with her, everybody stops immediately and like gathers around her. Eason David is very, very famous around here. And, uh, but her and uh, her wife, uh, they, they had a donor and it was born right around the, and so Miller was born right around the same time that uh, my son William was born and they were like best friends. Eason and my wife are, have been best friends since they were in kindergarten. And so we were very excited about the idea of like, wow, we have kids around the same age. They're going to be best friends like you. They're going to know each other forever. And there's actually a scene in the book where uh, uh, my son William is very different than Travis, uh, as he will tell you, because he curses a lot less and he's also nine. So, <laughs> but, uh, but certainly there's a scene in the book where it's Travis is Daniel's best friend in the book. And there's a scene in the book that is directly kind of one of the things that kind of happened with us, which is the kids were like the same age and they were kind of rolling around a little bit. And they, and they noticed, we noticed that, 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 uh, that Miller was unable to hold weight on his legs and William was able to. And so they, they thought it was curious. And, you know, they, again, they didn't know a lot of like the, frankly, the DNA background of, 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 of half of, half of Miller's DNA. So they kind of researched it, looked into it a little bit and they got him tested and they discovered that he had SMA and we had not heard a uh, type two. And so we had not heard of SMA. We were introduced to that world and uh and you know, I've been very inspired by Eason and Lindsay and Miller and Simmons, uh, his younger brother, uh, who have all, uh, the way they've kind of tackled this and the way, and you know, it's a different now, there's a drug called Spinraza that, that Daniel doesn't really have, that wasn't around when Daniel was young, but really makes a difference for Miller. But one thing I noticed, there was this, this event they would have every year called the Go Miller Go Run in Charleston. I went, uh, uh, my family all went, it was really fun. And there were all the, there were so many people with SMA and other kind of disabilities there. And you know, there were all these people that were there that were ostensibly, I mean, clearly there to support Miller and to help like raise awareness of, of SMA and, you know, try to help uh, fight the disease. But even though they knew intellectually that everyone there with SMA, their minds were fine. Like there was, they were just a regular, their minds are a regular person like everyone else. You just, they just couldn't help them. So like they, you, they, there was, there was an infant, infantilization. I can never say that word right. Um, about the way that they would speak to people. And I saw the consistent frustration from the people that like, you're supposed to be here on my side. So I got kind of that stuck, it stuck in my head a little bit. And uh, so I did some more research into it and, re and research. And I really felt like there was something about not just writing about SMA, but writing about the idea of communication. Uh, uh, communication to me is like, you know, D Daniel's job is he works for, he works for an airline uh, responding to angry travelers over Twitter, which as you might suspect, mostly gets called him horrible names on a pretty regular basis. And, and he kind of loves it because he's like, awesome. People are not treating me like uh, there's something different about me. They're just yelling. They just, they, I think his line is, uh, it's there's something very freeing about uh, uh, going to a place where people, people don't realize they're supposed to be nice to you and i think that there there's something there's something i think inherent to kind of daniel's personality about that and a lot of it has to do with his mother his mother uh, is a, was a single mother and she raised him uh in a very way to like encourage his independence and to and and to show that he's able to do this on his own daniel lives by himself like daniel is is uh is he is quite disabled but he he is he's very proud of the fact that he's able to live by himself he has caregivers and he has helpers but he lives by himself and i think that kind of idea of not only talking about SMA, 
but because I think the book is not about SMA. Daniel has SMA, and obviously we get into the details of his life a little bit, but really the book is about like a kind of, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's always weird to, I, don't, I feel like this is not something you're supposed to do. Kevin probably knows this. You're not supposed to tell people what the book's about. Uh, the, the book is, is literally about, it's a palindrome. You know, people have not realized it yet, but if you catch it and start to read from the back, it's a palindrome. <laughs> I'm giving away the game already. Um, but no, the, the, uh, a, a large theme of the book, I think, is about the idea of communication and, recon and, and taking advantage of the opportunities you have and recognizing kind of how amazing all of this is, no matter what your circumstances circumstances are. And I think that can't help but be perhaps a response to, uh, uh, at least if, if sub, just subconsciously, uh, what everyone's been through uh, in the last uh, four or five years. But uh, uh, certainly, you know, there's a line early on in the book where, where Daniel, who again is online all the time, talks about how like, you know, there's just all these little kindnesses that people do every single day that never get noted, whether it's just opening the door for someone or speeding up because someone has opened the door for you. Nobody like tweets that. Nobody says like, oh, wow, look at this really nice thing a random stranger that I'll never see ever again did for me today. Hashtag blessed. Like you just, uh, usually you're angry about something. And so I think Daniel's perspective on that, I, I think was kind of needed uh, uh, in uh, kind of what everyone's kind of going through. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think one of the things that struck me so much about the novel was um, when you talk about communication, I was thinking of connection too, and and all of those invisible threads that connect us to all these other people, um, and and all these people in Daniel's life who have these kind of small connections to him, and then those kind of incredible, amazing moments that are sometimes terrifying, where your world opens up even more, and you realize how connected you are, like the moment this woman goes missing and, and how big the world becomes for Daniel as he realizes his connections to all these people, I thought was really, really beautifully done. And um, I think I wanna maybe, uh, it's, it's cause you, it sounds like you started with Daniel's voice um, and, and this idea of writing about SMA or, or, or utilizing that in the narrative. So when does, when does this um, mystery, this disappearance, <laughs> when does that get folded into the book as you, as you conceive of it? You know, it's funny. That is actually uh, like all, all good journalists know that you just have to constantly steal other people's work at all times. That's actually how to succeed uh, in the field. Uh, no, that's not true. But I did, however, steal a real life thing that happened at the University of Illinois, where I went to college and, uh, and graduated barely, um, that uh, there was a, uh, a woman, actually a, a Chinese national, uh, who was abducted by uh, uh, her story uh, in, uh, in, a, in a pretty sad fashion, uh, but there was abducted about four or five years ago by a graduate student actually at the University of Illinois. And um, the thing that struck me is one of the news stories, but because there, there was there was a much milder search for 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 her, and I I wonder frankly how that might be different now than maybe perhaps it was four years ago, but. Um, uh, it did make some news and they had like a, an event where the people were like trying to look for her and it discovered later that the guy that had later confessed to abducting her was there and like interviewed on camera about how he was there to support the community. And there's something struck me as so chilling of, uh, about that and so kind of like uh, upsetting, you know, and, and also like, I know, like I went to school in Champaign. I grew up an hour south of Champaign. I know that area really, really well. And I was surprised that that wasn't like, the, the, it does have its own Wikipedia page. So I guess someone has mm -hmm. been chronicling it, but uh, certainly it was a very, un I, I thought that that story was kind of fascinating and I liked that idea. So um, I, 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 again, I, I had Daniel, but eventually, you know, you have to figure out something for Daniel to do. <laughs> and so, and, I, and, I, and to get in those lines of communication, the idea of how frustrating it would be, people have brought up real rear window a lot and for me rear window is like it's weird to say is it like a new rear window like rear window is one of like the classics of american cinema like it's like it's, it's not it's not like like rear window is almost a genre to itself at a certain level it's not like i think nothing could be an homage to 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 a rear window in the same way that nothing could be an homage to you know like a catcher in the rod, like it's just like this thing that exists in the world that that uh, uh the, the plot contours are obviously very different but i did like the idea of of Daniel being in a situation where he really is trying to reach out and try, like he can he can be helpful and he can do something, but how difficult it is for for not for him. Like I, one of the things that I think is very kind of interesting about it is that Daniel is completely frustrated. If someone would just calm down and listen for a second, Daniel could tell them everything in like 
15 minutes, but like everyone is constantly like uncomfortable around him or they're always kind of caught up in their own thing. You know, uh, uh, the, the police are like kind of a, uh, I, some people have said like, well, you're a little tough on the police. And I certainly don't mean that to be the case. It's more that like, this is a huge case. Like this is a massive case that's getting like national renowned and they're getting, uh, they keep trying to call this tip line, but everybody's calling the tip line line and half of them are, are teenagers uh, just messing around with it. You know, so at a certain level, I love the idea of Daniel trying to communicate. And also because of Daniel's disease, there's an inherent clock. You know, there's an inherent clock, not just for what's going on, but for him. And so I, I like the idea of, of tying that in, but certainly I would say, the most difficult part of putting the book together was making all those things fit, making all those things come together. There's a there's a character in the book named Wynn Anderson, which is the name of my youngest son. And you can tell how uh, late in the game that character showed up. Cause I was like, I need a name for this guy. Okay, you're literally sitting right there. So that is the name of that character. It's you, Wynn. So I, I hopefully when Wynn is six, hopefully when he's 26, he won't look back and like, oh, thanks for date naming the dumb cop character after me, dad. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, I, I think of the book as, as a subversion of Rear Window. So I, I think you're, you're doing a spot on good job with that. Okay, because okay. Um, I don't, I've, I have you, seen Rear Window though. So you, I did. <laughs> you, you subverted it beautifully. I, I did, I know we we're gonna open up to questions a little later, but I, I wanted I was I wanted to mention this, Will, because I don't know if you've seen it, but I, I thought you might, it's, um, um, it's from Lindsay and it says, um, I have a disability and couldn't have been more impressed with how you wrote from a disabled person's perspective. I read the author's note, but how were you able to get into the mind of a disabled person's head we appreciate the representation. P.S. Everyone on my bookstagram has loved it, and I have enjoyed promoting that. And and I was interested. That does lead me to the the question of of how 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 did you go about writing um, difference, right? Writing yeah. outside of yourself um, and being mindful of of this character. Yeah, yeah. I think there's actually two different aspects to that. One is writing outside of yourself, which I think is obviously a challenge for anyone. But you know, I I do share some things with Daniel. You know, I I uh, he's very observant. He's very uh, he's affable. I like to think of myself as aff affable adjacent. And uh, and you know, generally, I think that uh, Daniel believes people are good, and uh, so do I. And so he got so. Uh, and uh, da Daniel is uh, perhaps uh, less easily disabused of that notion. But this book takes place in 2019, so there's things that he hasn't seen yet. Um, but uh, I I would say when it comes to uh, uh, the idea of disability, to be honest, like there were really two different uh, kind of arcs with that. First was like doing the basic research and making sure I get the D ma making sure I, I get the big stuff right. And I'm capturing, I'm doing right by all those people I talked to at the Go Miller Go Run who, who and, and their families and kind of what their experience was like and how that is. But to be honest, a lot of it too was like, you know, I, I have, a, I have a, a friend who has a disability who had, oh, I, who, does, who had not read this and he read it recently. And he said, honestly, man, I couldn't wait to read this to see all the ways that you screwed it up. <laughs> this would be all the ways, because he said, that's what I do every single time I read a book. Like what, what, I, I don't want to name the book, but there's one where someone falls in love and there's another, they, and, they, and, they, and the sadness happens. It's all kind of hackneyed. And it's great. Books are really hard to write. I'm not like disparaging the book, but it's just, you know, I think that there's, there's, what, there's a way to do it and there's another way to do it. And I think that and he and he pointed out like that book was an example of someone of get someone clearly not doing a ton of research about it and just kind of using it as a little bit of a prop. And he's like, I, I kept waiting for you to screw it up and I didn't see it. And I don't know how you did that. I said, well, I showed it to a lot of people before you who said, mm -hmm. oh, you screwed that up. Fix that, fix that, fix that. And, you know, this is. I mean, I can't, no, like I can't, like I just, I mean, I, I, by def I'm an ab I'm able-bodied person, by definition, I cannot know this uh, better as well, or even not a couple points removed from someone who actually does have SMA or has the sort of disabilities that Daniel has. The best thing I can do is just basically be a journalist <laughs> and just talk to as many people as I can to try to avoid uh, the common missteps that I think people make when they write about uh, characters with disabilities. I did not, I'm sure I, there's things, I mean, I, I, can, I can't know. I, 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 I cannot capture the totality. I mean, there are frankly things that about Daniel's SMA that are uncommon to people that have SMA. Most people with SMA, for example, type two, are able to speak. Most people are able to speak. And Daniel talks about that in the book, about how, about how most are able to speak. And he, but one of the things I found really interesting talking to a lot of people that, had, that were dealing or had dealt with, uh, with SMA is because it's a progressive disease, like once you once you like stop doing something you just can't do it anymore which to me is 
I mean, it's tragic and awful. It's also like an incredible, like what a dramatic thing to write about. Like what a way, what a way to talk about this, like something like physically it can get away from you. Like that's, I mean, honestly, like what else? I have to tell you, I'm 45 years old and there are, like, as I get older, the number of things that I used to be able to do and have not done in a long time. Like, I think there's a, there's a metaphor for it, I think for, for, for everyone in that regard. So I don't know, like, again, you know, one of the most nerve wracking things about me, about this, about having the book out now and like out for everyone. Like I've run it by as many people as I can, but like, I have not run it by the world yet. And so uh, uh, for me to see, uh, a lot of people like yourself, Lindsay, who ha have disabilities and reading and saying this feels right. I mean, or at least right adjacent. Uh, that's 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 what I was trying to do because that's honestly I was just really nervous about it because I really want to like I I understand even by nature it's a little presumptuous to be honest as an able-bodied person to come in and feel like I'm going to write a first-person novel about someone that has a disability that I don't have and I, I was aware of that from the very very beginning of this and so the best I could do was just research it out and try to do. The best I can to get it right, and uh, hopefully I got most of it right. I cannot get it perfect, but that—that uh, uh, that was the goal. I was certainly tried to be as rigorous as possible uh, uh, about it, uh, and I had seen the mistakes that other people had made, and I tried to avoid them. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, I think that's a really great point. I think the fact that you were anxious about it to begin with is a good sign, right? Yeah, like, if, right. you know, if you're not anxious, then it's probably going to be worse. But I do. I like that idea of like, um, if you can if you can show that in writing outside of yourself that you're working hard to get those elements correct, yeah. right? That if you can build up enough goodwill, you can get the benefit of the doubt yeah. from the reader, knowing that you can never get everything right and everyone's experience is so different. Um, but I, I do love that idea of, of, of get, gaining enough goodwill that if you slip up, you can keep going, right? You still don't lose the reader. Um, I have another question for you that's a, maybe slightly more complicated or not as interesting, but um, the internet is so hugely important to the narrative, right? Like, and, you know, like Daniel's job is connected to like Twitter feed and customer complaints and Reddit and email are such hugely important like plot points to the momentum of the narrative. And one of the things I'm interested in is you kind of hone in on the necessity of the internet, right? Like how it opens up the world for us and and, and yet then there's the difficulties of anonymity and those dark places that you can go. Um, and I was thinking about your own relationship to the internet. Um, I, I guess, how did you fold that into the novel? You know, is, was, there, was that a, a consideration as you started to build this book or, or especially since Daniel is reliant in some ways on it for communication and information? Yeah, it was something I thought about early on because you know, I uh, obviously I'm, I found a dead spin. I think it's probably you know ho hopefully hopefully how lucky does well enough that, that that no offense to dead spin. I'm proud of the work I did there, but I'm okay with pushing it to the second paragraph of the obituary uh, rather than the 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 first. The second line will be like man stains carpet or something, but then like the second line will be will be uh, dead spin. Um, so I, I, I'm proud of the work I did there. I've worked on the I've worked on the internet for a for I mean she's more than 20 years now, and I remember what it was like at the beginning. And I, and I don't mean by the beginning, like when the computers the size of a house were, 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 were processing things. But, you know, I remember I, I didn't get my first email address until I was a senior in college. And, uh, and I, I was obsessed with writing for the student newspaper. And I, I, there's a great line by Roger Ebert, who's one of my writing heroes, that says, uh, like, the three most beautiful words in the English language to him are by Roger Ebert. And uh, I, I got upset. I became that person in college. I just wanted to write constantly, and I, and I just, I just, I had, I became very obsessed with writing all the time. But you were inevitably constrained by, you know, the pa paper and the page. You couldn't, and and so I remember when the internet came. I was like, oh my god, I can just fill, like, I can just fill everything. Like, they, they, they will never be able to stop me from like filling stuff on this. And then from that, because to me that was what initially appealed to, appealed to me. The internet it was not like put pictures up or or here's a picture of my dog or meet people. It was like, wow, there's this space where I can just write forever and, then, and just like a constant scroll. And I did learn to edit a little bit after that. But the point was, once you kind of got on and you realize, wow, wait, like I am weirdly obsessed with the one section of four rooms, the movie that nobody else likes. Uh, and I just found a bunch of weirdos like me that feel the exact same way from like news groups and, and, and alt news groups and so on. And 
that sense of discovery and that sense of, wow, I'm actually like not the only weirdo in the world that believes this or that the only person, like I, there, there's that old joke about how like everybody, uh, 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 every, everybody had that one kid that was caught pleasuring himself outside the band room. Like that can't be possible that that person actually existed in every high school, but every high school feels like they knew that nope, there's that guy. I don't know how that happened, but because all there are all these connections that we don't know. That, I don't know if you saw that Barb and Star movie that came out. It's very, very funny, but there's a great scene where they all, where she does, she gives, makes a suicide drink and she puts a different thing under each one of a Coke, of a Coke fountain. And I thought me and Denny Dooley, my best friend in junior high were the only people that knew that thing. I don't know how that happened, but apparently everybody did know that in their own little cities. And I wouldn't have known that until the internet existed. And to me, that is beautiful and still is beautiful. And, and, and I know that that gets obviously lost for obvious reasons about how terrible, <laughs> about how truly terrible uh, that uh, the internet can be on a regular basis. Occasionally it literally will inspire insurrections. So it's not always great. I'm not claiming that it's not always great, but there is something about that initial purity of uh, everybody feels alone. I think that's why we do social media. We feel, a, we, we get so into this because there's a little part of us that's just like, wait, is there anybody out there at all right now that feels the way that I do about things? That was my initial deep love of the internet. And not just when I first got on. I mean, I, start, I started Deadspin in 2005, but that was like my fourth or fifth web publication at that point. I was just the idea. And like, I remember uh, moving to New York and finding all these people who also were frustrated and wanted to do stuff and, and like, let's make a website. And we found all these other people that wanted to be a part of it. And it was just this very exciting thing. Whereas now, you know, it feels like if you were to start a website, it would be like, you know, I mean, is it, is it on parlor? Like, what are we, like, what are we, what are we doing? Like, it becomes like this weird, angry thing. And I don't think that's what the web has to be, or even is what is supposed to be. And so one of, I, I, I wanted Daniel to have that initial notion of discovery and that idea of like the internet is actually kind of a wonderful place for Daniel. Like it's something he really values and really sees even as transporting. And so, uh, and that, so that, that internet idea, Deadspin itself, Deadspin is, you know, Deadspin was more of a, I love doing Deadspin. It's something I cared about very deeply, but that turned, that became like commercial quicker than I was, uh, and, and larger than I was comparing it to. It was like a, I was like a, like an indie band that nobody listened to suddenly, you know, well, I guess being a slightly bigger indie band that nobody listened to, but, but quicker than I was ready for. And whereas I, I thought back in those early days of just how exciting and what a sense of discovery it was and, uh, and how, how Daniel would feel that way about it. Cause uh, that's, that, that is definitely a part of Daniel, the, the, the optimism and, uh, and but also the fact that, you know, the, what the internet is and is supposed to be, I think can and should be kind of lovely. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, ha having grown up in a tiny rural town in Tennessee yeah. and like, you know, having to drive an hour and a half to buy a, a cassette of some <laughs> yeah. band, you know, like the internet immediately made me feel less alone. It gave me access to things so that I didn't feel like I was always 10 steps behind the rest of the world. And I felt that same optimism that Daniel talks about of how it, it provides you access to things that are cut off, you know, and, and, and I still, I mean, partly because I'm not on social media or really on the internet much, I still have that kind of love for what the internet can be, how it can generate information so that I can figure out how I fit into this larger world. I um, mean, I'm interested in then how sometimes if you have that voice and you're deep into the internet, it becomes a persona and it can get twisted and dark and, and bad things can happen. And yet I love how Daniel holds on to the possibilities of it. Yeah, I, I, and honestly, the last thing on this for, about the internet, like to be honest, this was actually one of the reasons that I left Deadspin, to be entirely honest, was because it became clear that like, if I stayed any longer, it was going, the writing was gonna become a persona. It was gonna become, it was gonna become a thing, it, it, you know, it, it, you're a wrestling guy. It was just gonna be cheap heat, right? It was gonna, yeah. it was just gonna be a bunch of like, I remember one time I wrote a piece about something, I wrote a short blog post about something that was not particularly interesting or strong. And like the first five things were like, yeah, we'll get him, that's got him. You know? and, then, and, then it had, and I was like, wait, I didn't even say anything. I don't want this. And I realized if I just kept that going, I would, I, I, I would A, never get better and never do anything interesting, but B, I would, frankly become a monster <laughs> like if you like honestly like it would be hard not to right at a certain level where like this is you know 
I, I, we made it 38 minutes into not talking about Trump and I'll be very, very quick. But I remember I covered his first, uh, his first one of his first rallies at, in, in, uh, in Alabama, in uh, Mobile, Alabama. And that, that first one, and I realized watching him speak that like this was the personification of what is going on in his brain his entire life where everyone, it was just like, oh, everyone's just yelling me, 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 me all the time. That's what the internet can do to you. The internet can make you feel that like everyone is just constantly saying, what do you have to say, Will? What do you have to say? What do you think? What do you think? And if you get even a taste of the possibility that that might be true, you turn into bar stool or you turn into, you know, in, into that sort of thing. And I definitely wanted to avoid that. Yeah. Oh, well, I think you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it took um, a long time. <laughs> I want to, I do think it might be cool to go to these questions because they're really wonderful and they actually tie into things that I had wanted to talk about. So oh, it's a okay. nice way to do this. One is um, uh, kind of how long have you had the idea for the book, but more, uh, do you write this book if you don't move to Athens? And I mean, Athens mm -hmm. is so hugely important as the setting. Um, I did. I was curious. Of, I, I know, you know, you live in Athens, mm -hmm. but how, how does that become such an essential part of the story for Daniel? Yeah, you know, I, Athens is, you know, I've already started, one of the things that's been very nice about this book is it's already kind of done well, well, well enough that it's done what I was really hoping for it would do for me personally, which is they're going to let me do another one. <laughs> like to me, that's, I don't know how you, how it was when you, when you started really writing books, Kevin, but like for me, it's like, wait, they're going to let me do another one. Okay. Well, I just need that one to do just well enough that they will let me do another one. Cause I'm, I'm in now. I got it kind of locked in and I, and I kind of want to have everything set in Athens to be entirely honest, like almost the breaking bad or banger or main and Stephen King, like extended universe. Right. Because it's, fascinating like this, this place is you know i'd never actually been to athens until we were looking at houses here uh mm -hmm. and i never my, my wife went to school here and uh and but you know i mean i i, I think i can speak for it to and a lot of people from athens that are watching like going to school in athens and living in athens or it's a, they're two very different things and uh so so you know, we kind of learned it discovered it ourselves a little bit but one of the things that was so fascinating to me is there's just like obviously Georgia is a uh, uh, a a kind of watershed political at a watershed political moment. It's a center of attention politically, and I think a lot of it can be represented kind of by Athens and the surrounding areas. And there's just so many different types of people that live here. And whether it's the whether it's the you know you've got the normal town crowd, you've got the old music crowd, but you've also got the 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 frat bros. You've got the old you got the good old boys. You've got the the football people that come in. You've got the college. And you've got like there's so many different types of people that live here that you know, I, I lived in New York for 13 years and I, and I loved living in New York and I lived in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, which is a wonderful, wonderful area. But like, I started looking around, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of in Portland. Like I'm kind of like, and the thing is Portland, Portland is great, but I feel like there was just a bunch of people who saw the world the way that I saw it and, uh, and, and agreed generally with the things that I believed and therefore would never challenge me and I would never challenge them ever. And that made me uncomfortable. Uh, in, in a certain sort of way. And so for me, one of the things I love about Athens, you know, is also when you work in media, like my best five friends in New York all worked in media. And here, like one, like one's a preacher, one runs a, a board game store, store, one's a lawyer, one's a, like they, they and they don't, care at all what I do. <laughs> they have no interest in what I like. They might like, good job. Well, you wrote a book. That sounds hard. But like, but other than that, like it's not, and I feel like I'm getting a better sense of what people are like than I was in New York. And I, and I, I, I not say that not to say that I don't love New York and I, I, I love it, but though now I'm too old for it. Every time I go back, like everyone is just so young and beautiful and I have no place there at all. Um, but for me, that was one of the things I truly love about this place is you just meet so many different kinds of people, people that are not like me at all. Many people that I find myself uh, disagreeing with pretty profoundly, but we live together and we, and you know, that, that, that is something that, uh, uh, that I care about and I think is important. And so Athens to me has a, uh, near infinite, uh, number of, uh, of different types of people. So yeah, as long as I can keep, as long as they let me keep writing these, everything is going to be set in Athens. I really, it's also, I don't, I'm not, you know, it's weird. And I'm learning about all like the different classifications of, of books now. And I, contemporary fiction is what I've discovered is where, where I, where I live. And, um, which I think just means I can't write, I don't know how to write about dragons. I, I don't know. But, um, but at a certain level, like I, like I'm not gonna go do the, like I feel comfortable. There's so many things to see around here. And I just on a personal level, like, 
my life has just gotten calmer since I've gotten here. My children are here. They were mostly just regularly going to school <laughs> until very recently, but like I can walk them to school and I know their friends. I just, it's, you know, I mean, I, when I was starting Deadspin and I was young in New York city, I wanted everything and I wanted to do everything and see everything and experience everything. And now I can just focus on the stuff that actually matters and I care about. And I think it's not only made, I hopefully it's made the book better, but I think it's made my writing in general better because I'm, you know, I'm just aware, I know what I believe better uh, than I did before because it, it, it gets challenged a lot. That, that's a, that's an incredible love letter to Athens, uh, <laughs> I think. Um, now we just got to get the bands back. Yeah. We got to get the music <laughs> back here for crying out loud. So, I mean, building off of that, another question, uh, which is interesting, was uh, hearing you say you'd like to write more about Athens. Uh, someone asked, do you, do you have plans for, for Daniel? Uh, another another narrative for Daniel. Uh, well, I don't want to give away anything that happens at the end of this book, uh, whether or not it's even possible that Daniel could uh, could uh, be able to come back. But uh, I, you know, I we'll see. Uh, I like that. There are actually a couple of characters in How Lucky that I actually would like to expand out into the next project, and I think that they kind of uh, I even kind of seeded them a little bit with potential sort of uh, uh, things that I might want to use later, uh, but. Daniel, I mean, Daniel is, I, I, Daniel is so like, this is his story. You know, th this is Daniel's story. The idea of, I mean, this is like going back to the Breaking Bad thing. Like there's a reason that Walter White never shows up in, in Better Call Saul because he would have to like, you can't just have them be like, hey, look, there's a chemistry teacher. And he just goes, hey, and then we walk around their way. Like, like it, it, it stops the entire story. So, you know, this is Daniel's story. And I don't know, part of me feels like maybe this is, this is uh, this is the story. Uh, whatever whatever happens next for Daniel is uh, I, I think up to the up to the reader. I like that. Um, there's another inch which I had no idea, but it says a. Uh... What was the process of designing the book cover like? I noticed some Athens specific landmarks in the background, like <laughs> Rumby Hall and the Confederate Monument. So, did, how much say did you have? I mean, also having gone through this process, it might be very little, but um, in, in terms of the design of the cover. Yeah, they did a terrific job. That was a Harper thing. They did a terrific job, not just with getting the stuff specific in the background, though I did actually ask them to make the stadium a little bit more like Sanford Stadium. And they said, come on, there's a football stadium in the background. Like, come on, you're lucky we got you that. And, um, but, uh, but I, and also it's just hard to do. It's the design of Sanford Stadium is hard to do from a distance like that. But, um, I actually feel like they've got somehow, I don't know how they, cause I'm, I am, my wife is a, is an interior, is an interior designer. She's like brilliant at it. And look at these pillows, by the way, these are Athens local pillows, by the way, these are at, uh, and uh, they're off. They're awesome. She's incredible at this stuff. I don't mean that like they live in Athens. I mean, they were made by Athens artists. They also live in Athens cause they live in my house. Um, but more to the point, um, you know, she has this beautiful eye for color and this beautiful way of like putting stuff together. And I don't, there's a famous story in our house where like I went away for I went to go cover the Olympics in Russia. And when I came back, she had painted my office an entirely different color. And it took me like two weeks to notice. <laughs> like God. I would be the world, yeah. I'd be the actual world's worst police witness. I'd, I'd be like, I think it was a tall guy. Maybe I think he was wearing blue or red or blue, green or something. And so uh, I'm really terrible at that. But to me, what's really remarkable about that cover, it seems to like kind of capture the mood and the tone of the book in a way that I don't really quite understand. Uh, like to me, that's like the brilliance of people that are able to, to understand. The color is exactly right for Daniel, even though there's no moment where like Daniel says, I like to wear blue or anything like that. But the color and just the way it's put together, it's it's really like they're just incredibly talented people and uh, and how they do that. It really kind of blows me away how good they are with that because they, they seem to have uncovered something subconscious in the book that I did not even realize it was in there, but it's totally perfect to look at. And I think people have responded to that. I, you know, I think that we've been very fortunate. That a lot of people have, uh, there was a book of the month club pick, which I know you have been uh, as well, Kevin. And the way people choose books from that is always like, you know, people that don't know it, a lot of time they're just picking the cover. And uh, I think it's had a lot of popularity simply just because that cover is just so kind of striking. It, it would, I mean, you can see just color wise how it would look great in, on Instagram. Um, yeah. And I don't <laughs> yeah. mean that in a yeah. condescending yeah. way. Like yeah. it's, a, it's a really wonderful cover. And I think about that too. Like you're so excited to have a book come out and you want to be involved in it. And then you're like, I don't know anything about graphic design. Like, <laughs> yeah. And then you watch the way these people were, it's their job, right? It's what they've done forever. 
and it is kind of incredible how they can capture the essence of a book and and I really love and I love the 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 slightly open door yeah uh, of yeah, the house yeah, is just it, so really so wonderful yeah. even the font the font is both welcoming and also oddly disturbing like it's just they just really just I don't I don't know how they do it like honestly I it's there's nothing in the world as my wife will happily tell you there's nothing in the world I understand less than like color and design <laughs> and anything like before I met my wife I just had a pair of I had three pairs of blue jeans and six black t-shirts and I wore that every day for like six years and so apparently apparently uh when you grow up though yeah you can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Another great question here, because I'm really interested in this, Will, because because we haven't talked a lot, is uh, what novels do you read and love? And maybe are there any that influenced How Lucky? Yeah, you know, it's funny. One of my one of my dirty secrets uh, is uh, when I moved to New York City, like a lot of young you know, young writers going to go take over the world. I, I, I figured I was going to get there and immediately my genius was going to be discovered and everyone would be like, wow, thank you for coming. We were, we, we were looking for your, you and your voice. Thank you for coming here. And then I starved for like six years. Uh, but uh, I remember getting there and very early on uh, reading a heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius uh, by Dave Eggers. And not only, not only is it brilliant, but like he is, he went to the University of Illinois. <laughs> like he oh. is, he has a, he is a, like he worked for the Daily Illini right before I did. And I was like, oh, great. So not only is there already, there, not only is there already a me, there's like one that's like a billion times more brilliant than I am and has like a much more incredible story and has overcome so much more than I have. And I just, I'm never going to be as good as this. <laughs> I just, and, and I will say that like, there are certain writers, you are actually one of these writers that I have to be careful of reading before I write. Uh, because it's just, I can't get the voice out of my head. And Eggers has always been like, I, anytime he has a new book, I have to like clear, I have to make sure that like everything I'm writing is just like, dumb like like silly baseball listicles for like a week just so i can not like invest that. and there's even a little bit of that in how lucky i mean there's a there's a there one of my proudest achievements with with the book is that uh, what, what i was really hoping would happen and irritated my editor to no end would happen because the voice is daniels he's constantly you know he's very loquacious he talks all the time but there is one point in the book where he is unconscious and you know the book has chapters, and so there's one chapter where there's just the chapter number and there's no words, and because he's out. And I thought it would be like that's a very Eggers kind of thing to do. It's kind of like do this weird postmodern. The, the FAQ is probably also inspired by Eggers, but like it's so funny because so uh, the the response is exactly what my editor said it would be. It was like, oh, everyone's gonna think they found a mistake, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're right. He's exactly right. That's what happened. So there, you know, I would say like even like reading now, you know, I feel like. Uh, uh, I, uh, Courtney Sullivan, my friend Jamie Attenberg uh, is is a, is a beautiful writer. Uh, I've known, she she and I knew each other when we first moved to New York. We were a couple of online internet writers uh, hanging out at at Seven B uh, in uh, in the year two thousand. Uh, so to see the success that Jamie Attenberg has had, she is a wonderful wonderful writer. A fellow Midwesterner moved to New York, uh, become novel. She's she is she was actually one of the first people that I talked to uh, about this book. So I think that uh, uh, I think she was she patted me on the head. She's like, oh, you want to do this too. And uh, so it's, it, I've been very fortunate that she's been, uh, she's actually been a lot more helpful than that. I'm just making a joke, but uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, th those are the people to me that I, I, I feel I read them pretty regularly. And of course, in all honesty, I'm being cool about, it, but like, Literally, Kevin Wilson is <laughs> like I'm. Trying, I'm not gonna make a thing of it. I know you don't like it, and then I don't want to make everybody go through it. But to uh, to see, uh, uh, I mean, you are obviously right in the middle of that. Oh, well, that's very kind. I um, I wonder if you, I, you know, I actually also got the audiobook of yours, and I wonder if you've gotten to the part yet where there's that that. I have it yet. It's oh, really no. cool. It's interesting. It'll be a nice little thing for you to find out how they how they do that in the audio. <laughs> that's book. funny. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have I have your book of the month copy. I'm going to buy a hardcover copy and then I've got your audio book. So that's oh. three sales for you right there. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So this and is you have the galley. I sent it to you in the first place. Yes, so I know. Have, yeah. So if you need wallpaper for where you're, what you're doing there, it'll be very I'm blue. stocking up. I'm, hoard, I'm hoarding them. <laughs> yes. Um, so there's an interesting question here, which is, you know, the, the sheer, the blurbs from Carl Hyacin, Richard Russo, Stephen King, uh, Gary is suggesting that you might have used like uh, Bitcoin to, to bribe these guys <laughs> into, into blurbing your book. But, um, uh, you know, for people that don't know, like how, how, how did that happen? Like, how does the book find its way to Stephen King and, and that incredible, you know, um, 
uh, blurb. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't know how it found its way to you. So like, like for me, like, you know, I, again, you know, this is, not only has it been 10 years since I wrote a book, like I, like I, I, I don't, I've written a novel, like I wrote one YA novel, which by the way, made them consistently difficult to classify because they always want to say debut author. Okay, no, okay. Okay, debut fiction. No, no, okay, debut adult fiction. They're like, forget it. Never mind. He's just writer. <laughs> Once you put three ways to describe, they just give up. Uh, but I would say that like, when it came to, to like, it got my, my editor, Noah Eaker, and, you know, my agent, you know, my agent, uh, David Gernard is, like, they're both, they know the industry, and they're both very connected in the industry, but, I mean, you know, it's just hard to get people, also, the time that people were getting the book was around October, November, December, January of last year, which may be the first thing on people's minds was not necessarily, uh, let's go read this optimistic, happy uh, contemporary fiction. So um, I feel just kind of fortunate they picked up. It was funny because uh, you, you know, to me, the uh, Chris Bojalian also said like a very nice thing, but like, you know, the, to me, Stephen King thing is obviously amazing because yeah. so Stephen King represents you know, I mean, he represents not just like there's a really famous author. To many people, he represents books. Like he represents like what a right like is the only writer I would say a lot of my extended family knows. And so uh, the way that Oprah was back at like like I wrote I wrote a like silly book of sports puns that was like is it gonna be on Oprah? Like <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, but so you know, but I so I and it's great. But like you know, for me to to the the same thing like he had emailed my editor because my editor had got gotten him the book and said and he was really really into it. But to me. I will never get past that feeling of you know, everybody wants to feel like they're a, uh, they, they want to be accepted by people who they respect. And I, again, I wrote this thing without having any idea of whether if there was a non-zero chance that like my, that David, my agent could have read it and said, you know, well, I'm glad that you tried this. Um, have you thought about maybe ghostwriting an Adam Wainwright autobiography or something? And I, and because he's like, it's great. I'm glad you tried it. It's, I'm glad you did it, but yeah, and I literally had no assurance that would not happen. So to, to me, what it meant to get, uh, I think Chris Bojalian tweeted about it. And then I got the blurb from you, which to me blew me away. And then when Richard Russo, like Russo, like, like he like name checks Matty Ross and he name checks like these people in the blurb. And, you know, it, it still feels frankly kind of surreal. I, so I, I, it, to me though, you know, I, I, we've reached the point where, as I kind of said before, if I can get like another one of these, I feel like I won. Like I just wanted to just keep making them. But like the idea that people like you and Stephen King and, and Richard Russo would, would have, would, would not only be like, Hey, this is, you're right. This is physically a book. You have completed it. It has pages in order and the palindrome, you pulled off the palindrome. And I really <laughs> respect that you were able to do that, but, uh, but to then do that and then actually really, uh, uh, say such kind of things. I mean, I, it, to be honest, I, I haven't entirely processed it yet because again, you know, I'm not, I don't know this. I, I feel bad saying this, but I just, I don't know this industry that well <laughs> like i just like i just you, you know I, I i i i mean i don't mean that to sound like i'm just i'm confused i'm unfortunately cape man lawyer i'm confused by her but i just i don't know that like I, i've learned about bookstagram in the last in the last three months you know and i've been and and it's wonderful it's this great incredible community i just it's just not something i knew anything about before so it's it's pretty it's it's exciting but it still feels it feels a little like I, it definitely still has that imposter syndrome where someone's going to tap me on the shoulder and be like, like, no, that is Stefan Kingdo. <laughs> that, is, that is an entirely different person uh, uh, there as well. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I do think uh, to have Stephen King say that is just unbelievable and wonderful, but it's also just, you send this book out into the world and you just hope somebody finds it, you know, yeah, like you yeah. send a little flare out and and to know that anyone read it and cared about it is just such a kind of like amazing feeling. Um, and it says yeah, so much was... too about writers like you and Stephen King. Because like, to me, I have to say, it's remarkable to me that like, I mean, forget how Stephen King, like if Stephen King never writes another word the rest of his life and literally just goes to the beach and does bong hits the rest of his life and does nothing, he's fine. Like nothing, no, nothing is going to puncture him. Nothing's going to hurt him. Nothing's going to, and so the idea, not only that he constantly is writing, but he's like, what's a new voice? What's like, I have no connection to Stephen King. I don't know him. The idea that he's constantly voraciously reading for new things. I mean, speaks just wonderfully for, for like the kind of person that he is that how much he truly, truly loves this. 
I think it's good to end on Stephen King doing bong hits on the beat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sorry. yeah, he's like Michael Caine in Children of the Men. That's the know? best way to end <laughs> any, any interview. So yeah, I, yeah I was Not really the main beach, it's way too cold. It's way too cold. So. <laughs> oh my gosh, y'all, that was delightful. I feel super energized. Um, I really appreciate you both taking the time to do this. Um, and I didn't realize until tonight that you guys had not met face-to-face -face or Zoom-to-Zoom -Zoom before. Um, and for those of you who are not in the book world, um, authors do this kind of thing to support each other just because they care about books and reading and supporting writing as a career. So um, I know that we sort of joke tongue in cheek a little bit about none of us are really in this to make the huge bucks, um, but we we do appreciate making the huge bucks. <laughs> and I know that uh, Will and Kevin would really appreciate any purchases you make of their books from avidbookshop.com. Uh, we'll be sending out a post-event newsletter to everybody in attendance with links to the books so that you can order there. Um, but one thing that this does, in addition to bringing people together and getting folks a chance to talk about books and reading and the writing process, kind of getting this behind the scenes look at a conversation of these authors and what goes into making a book. It also, when we are able to show strong sales for events, it gives a very clear signal to the publisher. Um, and this publisher now knows about Athens, uh, but a lot of the time publishers are not aware of a whole lot that's going on beyond where their publishing houses are, which is usually New York. So we're sending a super strong signal that people in Athens read People support independent bookstores. People support existing authors who've been writing for a while. And they also support uh, debut thriller writers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I really appreciate you guys being here.